Words at War presents a colossal mystery story which sprang from a graveyard and staggered the world. Voodoo, voodoo, mumbo, jumbo. Who are we and where have we come to? Stir the cauldron and keep it hot. The elders of Zion have come to plot. <laughs> to plot, to plot, to plot, to plot. At midnight dark in a graveyard spot. Ha, 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 ha. Forgive our mirth. You see, we plan to dominate the earth. <laughs> Thirteen are told and the devil at night sitting on the tombstones, tombstones white, forged out of fantasy, born of limbo, hodo, hodo, mumbo, jumbo. <laughs> The words you have just heard are, of course, sheer nonsense. You who are listening will laugh at them, naturally, and with good reason. But for many years, there were many idiots who actually believed them. And because they did... Poland became a charnel house, reeking with the smell of death. Blood ran in the gutters of Lidzice, Rotterdam, Belgrade, Smolensk. Sixteen million human beings were slaughtered in Russia. By rope, by fire, by gun and sword. Untold millions of Jews and Christians perished against bullet-pucked walls, in gas chambers, by starvation and pestilence. And one man, an Austrian house painter, almost conquered the world. Words at War. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, brings you an adaptation of a portion of Conrad Haydn's Book of the Month choice, Der Führer. And now a word of caution. Tonight's script, written by Max Ehrlich, does not concern itself with the life of Hitler. That has been done before. Instead, this is the expose of a great lie, the men who conceived it and used it to serve their own ends. This is the expose of a colossal forgery written in the blood of the butchered. This is the incredible but true story of the false protocols of the wise men of Zion. France, 1864. Napoleon III, tyrant and autocrat, rules his groaning masses with an iron hand. The story begins with a little man, an obscure man, a lawyer by profession, one Maurice Jolie. Maurice Jolie, who at the moment has just entered the shop of the printer, Bouchier. Well, Monsieur Bouchier, have you decided to publish my little manuscript? Uh, I would not print it for a million francs, Monsieur Jolie. You will oblige me by getting out of my shop. And taking it with you. But, my dear Bouchier, there's nothing in it. It may be construed. Mon Dieu! Do you take me for a fool? I have eyes and I can read. Dialogue in hell between Machiavelli and Montesquieu. A ponderous title, my friend. But transparent. Your manuscript is treason. A seditious attack against the emperor. I do not mention the emperor. No, but you do not have to. This demon from hell you scribble off. This Machiavelli... Is the emperor. Very well, then. He is the emperor. But, Monsieur Bouchier, it is time that France knew how Napoleon tyrannizes and crushes his people. You will be performing a public service. I am interested only in keeping my head on my shoulders. This manuscript of yours, mon ami, is an invitation to guillotine. Now take it and get out. <laughs> No French printer would touch Jolie's manuscript. Finally, in desperation, he took it to Belgium, where it was published as an illegal propaganda pamphlet. Very few read it, and for 30 years it languished in oblivion. For the record, Napoleon III shuffled off this mortal coil of victim of gallstones, and Maurice Jolie died a suicide. But mark you well Jolie's pamphlet, Dialogue in Hell. Put it aside, digress for a moment, but do not forget it. For it was the beginning, the first step of the great lie. The second step, 1868, Germany. A certain Hermann Gottsche, a minor official in the Prussian Postal Service, fancied himself as a writer of fiction. Under the English name of Sir John Redcliffe, he wrote a novel called Beyeritz. 
And in this novel, there was a chapter entitled In the Jewish Cemetery in Prague. And a remarkable piece of fiction it was. Let's see if we can reenact it for you as radio will permit. It was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and the clock was approaching midnight. The sinister graveyard in Prague, serried with row upon row of white tombstones, stood bathed in the eerie moonlight, waiting. Waiting. Then, one by one, pale figures crept into the graveyard, 13 in all. Among them, the representatives of the ten lost tribes of Israel. Silently, they gathered in a ghostly group around one of the graves. And then spoke the Prince of Manasseh, for it was indeed he. Brethren of Zion, ye have gathered here at the tomb of Simeon ben Yehuda. Blessed be he. Ye have come from the four corners of the earth, armed with the dreadful secrets of the Kabbalah. Shall we now proceed, O Prince of Manasseh? No, wait. There is yet another of us who must appear. Which one is that, O Prince? He shall be nameless. But he will come from the tomb. Ghostly figures wait silently, fearfully. And then from the tomb of Simeon ben Yehuda. It is he, the nameless one. Come, let us kneel. I am here, brethren. We greet you, O son of the accursed. Proceed with the business at hand, for the clock strikes twelve. Speak, O Prince of Manasseh. Brethren, for eighteen hundred years we have fought our war. Everywhere we have been downtrodden, persecuted, oppressed, but we are not conquered. Once every hundred years, as it is ordained, we meet to discuss our plan for conquest. What secrets have ye now, my brethren? One by one, the kneeling figures answer. There is no greater power than gold, hard yellow gold, to bribe princes and kings. The literature of the world, the press, these are the keys to kingdoms. What people read, people believe. The courts and parliaments, political bodies, these must be influenced. The youth, let us whisper in the ears of the young. And so it went down the line until the very end. And finally, when the last elder had spoken, the Prince of Manasso rose. Reverend, go now and execute these plans. We shall meet again in a hundred years. In solemn conclave then, as now. Go and work thy will. Adieu, O accursed one. Farewell. Farewell, brethren. The nameless one disappeared in the tomb, a flash of blue light, and one by one the thirteen ghostly figures crept away, and there was naught left but darkness and silence. This was the mumbo-jumbo that Herman Gautche, alias Sir John Redcliffe the Younger, cooked up in his spare time. Pretty childish nonsense, you'll admit. Not very well done and meant for primitive minds. Among other things, for instance, Herman never explained where he found the ten lost tribes of Israel, which had been lost for 2,000 years. He never explained either why the elders met in a cold and uncomfortable graveyard instead of a nice, warm back room with refreshments all around. Anyway, let's get back on the trail of the great lie. Herman Gotch's gorgeous ghost story was published in pamphlet form, and lo and behold, was marked authentic. A few professional anti-Semites tried to peddle it, but without much success. As Gotch wrote it, it was too much even for congenital idiots to swallow. And then it came into the hands of the Yochrana, secret police of the Tsar of all the Russias. Hmm, an interesting pamphlet, this, Sergei. Yes, General Oryevsky. Written by an Englishman, eh? Sir John Redcliffe, the younger. No, Excellency. The name Redcliffe is a blind. 
Mm. The real author is an obscure German novelist, one Hermann Godzi. Mm. Interesting, very. I didn't think a German could have that much imagination. Of course, Sergei, this graveyard story is sheer rubbish. Of course. Still, I think we can use it. Use it? But, but how, Excellency? Sergei, the people are showing revolutionary tendencies. They're beginning to murmur against the Tsar. We must use harsh measures. Suppress them. Yes, but this pamphlet, I don't see how... The usual technique, Sergei. Give the peasants something to hate while we make them serve us. They'll be so busy hating that they won't notice what we're doing until it is too late. Ah. Now, a small minority would be very convenient for the people to attack. A certain small minority. The Jews, Excellency? Exactly, the Jews. Have this pamphlet printed in Russian, Sergei. See that it is distributed among the people. It ought to do wonders. Excellency, uh... With your permission, this graveyard story may be a little far-fetched, even for our ignorant peasants. Mm. Mm, quite so, Sergei, quite so. Perhaps we should rewrite it. Perhaps in the form of protocols? Yes, yes, protocols. That would give this fable the appearance of truth. The protocols of Zion. Not bad, Excellency, not bad. Mm, thank you, Sergei. Uh, General Orievsky, may uh, I suggest the man to convert the pamphlet? By all means, do. Uh, General Rachkovsky. Rachkovsky? Yes. Yes, of course. The fellow has a genius for this sort of thing. Get in touch with him at once, Sergei. This was the third step in the series of fateful events. Now, remember the pamphlet of Maurice Joly, the French lawyer that we put aside for a while? Well, General Rachkovsky of the Tsar's secret police found it at this time and read it and was struck with an inspiration. General Larevsky, we have only to put Machiavelli's words into the mouths of the mythical Jewish elders in the Prague graveyard. You mean combine the Joly pamphlet with the graveyard story? Yes. Then we shall have something that will frighten the wits out of not only the people, but the Tsar himself. Excellent, Rachkovsky. Excellent. I uh, trust this French lawyer. What's the fellow's name? Maurice Joly? Was a Jew? No, Excellency. He was not a Jew. Oh, dear. Are you sure? Unfortunately, yes, Excellency. His baptismal papers are a matter of public record at the Church of Saint Desiree. Well, it does not matter. We are not dealing with the truth here. Proceed with your task. Prepare the protocols of Zion. It will be interesting to see what effect they have on our dear people. And what effect did they have? Here is the answer taken straight from history. It is the town of Orsha, population 14,000. It is a day of national festivity, a day when the peasants have swept the bitter thoughts of poverty and oppression from their minds, a day when Jews and Christians alike dance in the streets. But suddenly and mysteriously, the music trails away. The dancing is ended. Into the square come the agents of the Peasant. Russian secret police. They're distributing pamphlets to the people, shoving them at one and all. Then an agent climbs on a cart. Master morale, neighbors, listen to me, peasants. Listen to me, please. Please listen. Today you dance, you sing, you laugh. You've forgotten your misery for the moment. Well, now is the time to remember <laughs> these pamphlets. Read these pamphlets. If you cannot read, let others read them to you. You will see who is responsible for your hunger and poverty. The pamphlets tell all. They are printed. See? They are the truth. About the plot, a Jewish plot. Come, come here. I thought it, was it is true. In the graveyard at Zaksamet. This is true. See, it is printed. Here in this book, it is printed. Fear it our is enemies. Fear yeah. Fear yeah. Our it is they who are responsible Fear. for our misfortune. Thousands of peasants 
Prince, hitherto good-natured human beings, came in from the countryside, armed with axes and knives and clubs and guns. Passion and hatred were whipped to white heat by the secret police, and the first murders followed. Finally, on the 23rd of October, the vice-governor of the province spoke to Vermont. Peasants! People! People of Warsaw! Listen to me! Now, children, it is enough. You have had three days of fun. Now go home and sing God Save the Tsar. A pogrom, by definition, is simply a massacre. You don't hear the word much lately. Nowadays, it's called purge or liquidation. But to get on. In the one month of October, 1905, there were no fewer than 690 pogroms staged in all of Russia. 690 times the cobbled streets were drenched with the blood of an innocent minority due to the perpetration of the greatest fraud in history. But please don't fret about it. The pogroms nearly always ended on a nice note. Come, come, children. It is enough. You have had your fun. Now go home and sing... God save the Tsar! If this were fiction instead of truthful history, right there is where the story would end. But history is a perverse thing. Our story continues. A summer day in 1917. On this day, a student was reading in his room in Moscow when someone knocked at his door. Come in. Alfred Rosenberg? Yes. I'd like to leave this book with you. Just a minute. Who are you? It doesn't matter. Just read the book. I don't understand. What? You will when you read the book. Goodbye, Herr Rosenberg. The Protocols of the Vice Men of Science? A mysterious occurrence which doesn't make sense. But Alfred Rosenberg, who later became the official philosopher of the Nazi party, swears that it happened. However, Alfred Rosenberg read the protocols from cover to cover and was deeply impressed. I believe it. I believe every word of it. Yoda! This book has brought forth your innermost thoughts. Something will come of this. Thus spoke the student Alfred Rosenberg, son of a German shoemaker born in Estonia. Thus spoke this young mystic, this seer, this soothsayer and prophet in the year 1917. As to the identity of the stranger who brought him the protocols, no one knows. It could have been the devil, if you believe in devils. The thing to remember is that the great lie had found its way into the right hands at last. To review, there had been... Maurice Scholli, Frenchman. Herman Gudger, alias Sir John Redcliffe, the younger, German. Oryevsky, Lachkovsky, Russian. And now, Alfred Rosenberg... Estonian area. Mark this man, Rosenberg, and mark him well. As the onrushing Bolshevist armies rolled westward, Alfred Rosenberg flees before them, first to the Baltic, then Berlin, finally to Munich. While Lenin calls the world to revolution, holding aloft the Communist Manifesto, the refugee Alfred Rosenberg carries the textbook of world dominion in his battered suitcase to Germany. But this Germany is a new Germany, an ugly breeding place of conspirators plotting for power. And in Munich, Rosenberg, with his printed dream, found certain kindred spirits, among them a young officer named Rudolf Hess, another called Ernst Röhm. We need a leader, a strong man and a ruthless man. A leader is not enough, Hess. This dumb the Russian revolution sweeping towards us is the support of the masses. We, too, must have the support of ours to counter it. Here in your book, right. But above all, you need a plan. Well, come on, Rosenberg, speak up. What have you in mind? First, 
The masses must be softened, split among themselves from within. We must create chaos in society. Keep the people so busy hating something or someone that they'll be disorganized. One easy prey for us. Yeah, you talk like a university professor. I'm a simple man. If you have a plan, Rosenberg, produce it. Easy, Rhyme, easy. What we need is a scapegoat to divert the attention of the masses. A scapegoat, huh? Um, what kind of scapegoat? Well, my dear Hess, how about the Jews? Oh, the Jews. Of course. The Jews. Ah, but how can we inflame the people against the Jews? This little book, Rhyme. Everything we need is in this little book. <laughs> book? You cannot win power in Germany with a book, Rosenberg. Now, my dear Rhyme, that is where you're wrong. In this little book is the secret of the domination of Germany. Yeah, and even more than that, the world. Let me see it, Rosenberg. Hmm. The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion. Three men and a little book, and a disgruntled nation bowed low under the Treaty of Versailles. Three men and a little book, and a nation smarting under the Treaty of Versailles. sweet voice of reason try to prevail, and there were reasonable men in Germany. But people, why? Why? What have the Jews done? The answer was the same as in days of old. What have they done? You hear that, German? Yeah. He asked what the Jews have done. Ah. Here's what they've done. Read for yourself. The Protocols of Zion. Drawn up in a Prague graveyard. Here it's written right here. It's printed. It's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, Graham, was I right about the little book? Yeah, Rosenberg. It's almost incredible. <laughs> My stormtroopers, the, the people have all gone mad with hate. The blood of Jews flows in the streets. And amazing people are Germans. <laughs> to think that they could be taken in by this ridiculous graveyard tale. It is <laughs> not ridiculous, Hess. It is the truth. Oh, very well, my dear Rosenberg. <laughs> it is the truth. The people are blinded. They cannot see. We can do anything we like. Now is the time to strike. Yes, but first we need a leader. That's uh, right, Hess. We need a leader. A strong man, a man without pity, a man who can sway the masses, a man facile enough to suit any occasion. You talk in little, Strasbourg. Do I? Why, it's very simple, my dear Rhyme. You have only to read the protocols. We can use it not only as a weapon to divide peoples and therefore control them, but a textbook for ourselves. It tells us, for instance... The leader must be nationalist or socialist, pacifist or warmonger, democrat or tyrant, whatever is politically convenient at the time. Continue, Rosenberg. Continue. He must be Führer by virtue of bayonets and the power of propaganda. And finally, the stupid masses whom he has politically raped will even applaud him. Again, Rosenberg, you speak like a doctor, Herr Professor. You don't understand, Rhyme. Everything we need is so simple. Everything is in the little book. Um, yeah, perhaps. But this leader, where are we going to find such a man? I think I've already found him, Graham. Yeah? Who? Who is this genius? Yes. He was recently a corporal in the army. Now he's an informer here in Munich. His name is, the name of the Führer. Adolf Hitler. Yes, that just about brings us to the part of the Nazi legend most people are familiar with. But our story would be incomplete if we did not cover one more angle. De Führer once wrote a book, 
It was called Mein Kampf, and it made him a fortune. With it, he proved that if a lie is big enough and bold enough and repeated often enough, some people will finally believe it. Yes, he's proud of that book, for in it, he says, he reveals clever and original ideas on how to conquer the world. But the fear of flatters himself. He cribbed, lifted, stole from the heinous literary fraud known as the Protocols of Zion. Yes, to the fur as many crimes can now be added plagiarism. Listen. We Germans shall create unrest, hatred, and struggle in Europe and afterwards in other countries. You will find this in Mein Kampf, also in the Protocols. The words are a little different, that is all. We shall divide the people in every state by envy and hatred, by struggle and warfare. Even by spreading hunger and pestilence, we shall force all people to bow to our will. You'll find this in Mein Kampf, also in the protocols. The words are a little different, that is all. We shall paralyze and seduce the youth. We shall use bribery, treason, hypocrisy, treachery. The end justify the means. Anything for Germany to rule the world. You'll find this in Mein Kampf, also in the protocols. The words are a little different, that is all. We Germans are the chosen. We are the supermen. If any state dares resist us... Let's turn it off. Proof is proof. Quaderat demonstrandum. Well, there it is. These are the true facts about the garbled graveyard story, the fantastic forgery whose propagation has caused untold misery to millions. This is the true story of the great lie and its final use as Defira's personal Bible and guide, his weapon with which to attack one minority and eventually every minority. This is the macabre comedy of fantasy, forgery, and tragedy that we allow to be played upon the stage of the world. May heaven and our children forgive us. Listening to the 41st offering of Words at War, a radio play based on a portion of the new Book of the Month choice, Der Führer, by Conrad Haydn. Tonight's adaptation was written by Max Ehrlich, and the players included Gregory Morton, Junius Matthews, Martin Wolfson, Norman Lloyd, Daniel Ocko, Barry Kroger, Sid Cassell, Boris Marshaloff, Ed Jerome, Kermit Murdoch, and Liesel Falke. The music was selected and played by William Meader, and the entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next week, Words at War will present John Hersey's A Bell for Adano. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. This is the National Broadcasting Company.